Mate, what's going on this week? Welcome to episode 37 of the Exponential Performance Podcast, and it's so good to have you here. In today's episode, I'm tackling two questions from listeners out there. First one is about cramp. What's the deal with cramp? Why does it happen? What can you do to stop it? I also share a little tip in there that's something that I have started to work out through the research and through some hands-on experience with athletes about a really good way of preventing cramp if you cramp up in the same spot repeatedly. Second question is about strength training for cyclists during the in-season. Let's get into it. Welcome to the Exponential Performance Podcast. Join sports scientist and performance coach Matty Graham to find out how to train smarter and maximize your performance no matter who you are. Mate, welcome to episode 37 of Matty Graham and it is so good to have you here with me this week. Sorry to all of the regular listeners out here who have been waiting for an episode for the last couple of weeks, but it has not come. I have been absent for a couple of weeks. My apologies. Things have been a bit crazy here. I have had my other hat on for a few weeks doing some active transport work that I do in conjunction with the local council and the police uh, here around the Queenstown Lake area, working in schools, um, making kids get to school safely uh, in other ways apart from just getting in the car and getting driven. So I look at uh, bike safety and pedestrian safety. So I'm sorry I've been away for the last couple of weeks, but we're back in the game now. And I have a big Q&A session today where I'm going to be tackling two relatively complex questions from the listeners out there. Uh, And so rather than uh, kicking around with any introductory preamble foreplay chat let's just jump straight into the first question from Jonathan Jonathan what is your question yeah g'day Matty uh, Jonathan here from Wellington uh, huge fan of your podcast been really useful so thanks for putting it together um, I'm a surf ski paddler the races I do are typically two to three hours in length and I've been having a few issues cramping up in them lately. Um, so I'd love to hear what uh, suggestions you've got for preventing cramp. Uh, I look forward to hearing from you. Cheers. All right, so cramp. Cramp is a very interesting topic. Well, I think it is anyway. Most of you listening to this may suffer from cramp. Uh, and what you find is that Most people don't suffer from cramp during training. It's during the big, hard races that they start to suffer from it in. So let's just have a little bit of a think about the background of cramp. Now, I've done a couple of videos on cramp before, and I'll post those in the show notes over at exponentialperformancecoaching.com under the podcast tab, episode 37, if you want to check those out. But I'm going to dig into it again today. Because one, those videos are a little bit old and, you know, research develops and science, you know, progresses. And that's the great thing about science. It never is just done. There's always other people out there testing theories um, and adding to the, the, adding pieces to the puzzle, so to speak, so we get a better picture of what's happening. And the, I'd say the same thing's happened to cramp since I did those videos. And I guess my thoughts around cramp have changed uh, a little bit, uh, and I've more added to them than changed my thoughts, I guess you'd say. So, a little bit of a background around cramp. So in the early days, uh, a lot of workers, uh, labourers, construction workers, miners, they were found that they experienced cramps working in very hot conditions uh, underground. So construction workers under big buildings uh, in the United States, miners down in coal mines, that sort of thing. They're in very hot conditions. They found they sweated a lot. They got cramps. So a lot of people thought that it was due to sodium loss. And a really cool study that looked at Ironman athletes and the South African Ironman, so a relatively hot Ironman, separated the groups into those that cramped and those that didn't cramp. And they actually had a look at blood sodium levels pre and post, so 
before and after. And what they found was that sodium or salt levels in the blood weren't any different between those that cramped and those that didn't cramp. So even though you're cramping, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have got low sodium levels or that you've sweated it out. You need electrolytes, so to speak. So it's really interesting that one of the most common mechanisms of cramp, that sodium or electrolyte imbalance, isn't always true. And so while it may be the case, okay, and I would never say it's not the case, because what I'll come to understand is cramp is a very complex issue, and it's not just one thing that's causing it. But a lot of people go and look at the electrolyte thing first of all, and it's probably a good place to start, and you want to make sure that you're getting adequate electrolytes, or sodium, for example. Most people eating a general Western diet are probably getting enough sodium. And if you're consuming gels and sports drink in the race, you're probably going to get as much sodium as you need as well. But it doesn't seem that sodium is a big factor in cramp. It potentially plays a part for some people, but potentially not all people, and it's maybe not as important as we thought it was. What has been found with cramp is it is more a nerve problem than a muscle problem. So the sodium debate, I guess, has always looked that the muscle is running out of sodium, and so it's not able to contract and relax as it normally would, because sodium is one of the key regulators in muscle contraction. Uh, and all a muscle contraction is, is sodium and potassium going in and out of cells, uh, and causing an action potential or an electrical signal to happen to contract the muscle. And so if you don't have enough of that raw product around, it's unable to do that act, uh, act, active contraction and relax, relaxation. So the idea was, is if you've got, if you don't have enough sodium, you put some more in, it should help it. And that seemed to work in some cases, but not in all cases as we started to dig into things. So what it actually is thought to be because no one actually knows and I'm not going out there to say that this is what cramp is 100% but this is what the research sort of it's thinking or the the, the puzzle is sort of coming together for cramp and it's a, a neuromuscular so it's not just a muscle and it's not just a nerve it's the combination of the two and so what happens is when your muscle wants to contract, there is a, a neuromuscular signal from the brain saying, fire this muscle. And an electrical signal travels along the nerves, makes the muscle contract. Now with cramp, what happens is the muscle contracts, but the signal for the relaxation to happen doesn't occur. Or there are multiple contraction signals sent at once causing the muscle to contract or spasm. So for an optimal performance, this loop of signal sent to contract, relax, signal sent back, signal sent to contract, relax, signal sent back, this is getting interrupted somewhere along the line. And we know that fatigue disrupts this process, this neuromuscular pathway. Uh, and this is why cramps usually happen, or happened in greater quantities, I guess, at towards the later stages of a race. But it's not the only time that it happens. It also can happen in very short, hard races at the start when you when you cramp up. So we know it's not just fatigue. Uh, and this is, I guess, where the electrolyte imbalance uh, theory is always pulled out. Be because it happens towards the end of races when people are hot and sweaty, they say, oh, I just need more salt, and this should cure it. Well, maybe not, because we know that in an Ironman, for example, in this in this case of the Ironman uh, South Africa, there was no difference in how much salt someone had in their bloodstream, whether they were cramping or they weren't. So this idea of cramp being a neuromuscular issue is sort of where thinking is at the moment with cramp. And because it's a neuromuscular issue, we cannot really just give a silver bullet to solve the problem. What I would suggest is that it needs to be taken care of in training as much as possible. And this is why, because 
what's happening is when you are getting a mismatch between what your body's conditioned to do and what it's actually doing on race day, there's a mismatch. You're either going harder or longer or harder and longer than your body is used to or prepared for. And so your body is starting to cramp, that muscle's cramping, as a way of de down regulating your work output so that the body goes easier so it's able to work back within the ranges that it's able to so you're pushing yourself beyond what your body's able to sustain and cramp is kind of like a bit of a safety mechanism i guess that's going to slow you down so you don't work beyond that capacity while it's not always seen as a safety mechanism when you're racing it's one of the worst things to happen uh it is there for a reason i guess and so we can train to increase our ability to not cramp. Now, if you ever think back, not many people, in my experience, cramp during training. But most of the cramp that happens, happens during racing. And so that's where that mismatch between intensity and duration happens. I always thought that if I'm cramping in training during some really hard sessions... It's like, good, it's a good signal because it means that I'm working at my capacity and I'm training my body at that limit where uh, I want it to be for race day. So really focus on maximizing each of those areas. If it's the intensity that you need to work on, focus on adding in more intense efforts in training. If it's the duration that you think's getting you, then do some longer sessions. If you find that you're cramping towards the end of a race, you might want to focus on that duration. If you're doing both of those, you're getting that intensity in there and you're getting the duration, it could be a potentially combination of the of both, which is which is what it is for most people. It's not just one or the other. So if you are cramping towards the end of a race, uh, I had an example the other day of an Ironman athlete who was getting towards the end of their run and, and they had they were starting to get cramped, starting to cramp up really badly in their legs. And what they sort of came to the determination was is it wasn't actually how hard they were running, it was how hard that they had biked previously. They set a PB in the in the bike time, in the bike stage, sorry. So they had a PB in the bike, so they biked a lot quicker than they normally do. And then they got off and ran as fast as they normally run, but the intensity of that bike previously had come to bite them in the, well, in this case, it was the inner thigh. So we need to focus on that intensity and duration mismatch between training and racing. If you can make yourself cramp up in training because you're pushing yourself so hard, not in every session, but in those key race simulation sessions, then I think you're going a long way to preparing yourself for race day. Now, I think the specific environment that you're training in is crucial. A classic one for this is the coast-to-coast -coast mountain run. Now, the coast-to-coast, -coast, for those that don't know it, is a multi-sport race here in New Zealand. It goes from the west coast to the east coast of the South Island. It's a multi-sport, so it's running, cycling, and kayaking. Um, the running is over a route called Goat Pass, and it, there's not really any tracks or trails that you run along, so it's not really traditional trail running. It is very rough running on a riverbed. There's big rocks and boulders the size of houses and small cars that you have to climb over. You're running on this very uneven surface the whole way. Half of it's uphill, the other half is downhill, and people cramp up a lot on this run there's a lot of river crossings in and out of cold water as well uh, and you you do this following um, a, a sprint like a two kilometer sprint off the beach you're on your bike for a couple of hours and then boom you're into this mountain run and cramp is so prevalent in that race i'd put money on it that not many of the people that cramp during the race cramped in training They've all done the run more than likely, so they've covered the specific terrain, they've done the duration, but the intensity's not there, or the intensity in that order, the run off the beach, the bike at that intensity, and then the run as well. So making 
your training specific to the order of the disciplines that you're going to do, the intensity of that of those disciplines as well, and then also the environment, so getting off-road onto that terrain. Now, Jonathan, I'm not sure you said you experienced cramp in the surf ski. I'm not exactly sure where you're experiencing these cramps. Uh, often kayakers, believe it or not, get cramp in their legs, in their calves, and in their, in their quads as well, or their inner thigh. Um, so you'd think that kayakers would get cramp in their upper body. They certainly do, but a lot of the time their cramp's actually coming from their lower body working hard with the leg drive in the boat. So this leads me on to my next point, I guess. If you've addressed that intensity, that duration, um, the specifics in terms of those, and then also the environment, whether it be in kayaking, surf ski paddling, if it's, you know, do you suffer more from it in really rough conditions where you've got to brace more, um, with the chop and the waves, or do you experience it mostly on flatter, um, calm races? Whereabouts in the race do you experience? All of these questions are questions for you to think about and then address in your training to help reduce the influence of uh, the, the incidence of cramp. Now, one thing that I haven't covered before in my cramping videos, and this is something that I can't really find any research about. But it's something that I'm starting to piece together from uh, sort of the cramping physiology and then also practical real world case studies of athletes that I'm working with. And what I find is that most people will cramp in the same place repeatedly. So let's say you get a cramp at a certain race and let's say it's in your calf muscle, you know, let's say it is the medial aspect of your calf, so the inside of your calf, you can almost put your finger on, this is where I cramped. Now, if you do some more training, go back and race again in, say, a couple of months, the likelihood of you cramping in that same spot is very high. And if you told me that you cramped again, and I asked you, where was it? I would put good money on it that it was that exact same spot that you cramped last time. Why this is, I don't really know, but... And, and no one really knows, to be honest with you. But if you have if you have a dig around in that area, have a massage around with your thumbs, whether it be your calf, your inner thigh, or your quads, that area that you always cramp in, I'd almost put money on it that there's a knot or a tender area in there. And so I was meant to actually record this podcast last night, but while I was doing some research and putting some notes down, I... I sort of went down a bit of a rabbit hole um, around this area looking for you know latest research and that sort of thing. And so it's actually the next day because I ran out of time to record the podcast. But what I actually really looked into is like what is actually a muscle knot? And to be honest, no one really knows what a muscle knot is. Uh, it's really hard to determine. They're often referred to as myofascial trigger points. Um, or what they think it might be, and which I found really interesting and it sort of sparked interest and added to this sort of theory of mine, is they think knots, or that tight spot in a muscle, that you can actually feel. It feels kind of like gristle or a lump in there. They think it's due to an overactive nerve leading to that area. So the muscle in that area, the muscle tissue in that area is tense. Uh, and this is why if you push on them and rub them, they sometimes relax and you get that myofascial release. But to be honest, no one really knows exactly what they are. They can't explain it with science at the moment. Uh, potentially our thinking or our methods aren't advanced enough to do that. But this sort of joined in nicely with my ideas around cramping and that if you cramp in a certain spot, you're probably going to cramp there again because of this knot or this overactive nerve leading to this area. So what I've found that works really well, if you are cramping, say, in your calf in that certain spot that you can pinpoint, some really good soft tissue massage uh, can help. And I'm not exactly sure why, but it helps release the knots or uh, decrease the activity of that nerve. So if you can get some work on that specific area for a month or so, so a massage a week sort of thing, to work out that, that spot on your inner thigh, 
or work out those calves, it goes a long, long way. I've had multiple athletes who have cramped in the same spot repeatedly go and get some really focused, intense massage work on that area by a good massage therapist, and they've come out of it uh, with that area bomb-proof, if you like. It's not going to cramp in the future in, you know, in those races if they stay on top of the maintenance of it. So if you cramp in the same spot over and over again, I'd highly recommend going and getting some soft tissue work on it. Why? I don't really know, to be honest, but it seems to work. Uh, and I would be interested to know if you are one of these people that cramp in the same spot over and over again. If you go and get some uh, massage work on it, does it work for you? Let me know because I would be interested. I have found it works quite well with a number of athletes that I have been working with. The other note, I guess, is people would say, well, why don't you just do some foam rolling or some stretching to, to help it yourself? You can do that, and I think I've said it before, um, but I like to outsource this pain because no matter how good you are at foam rolling, you can't really get in there like a massage therapist does. So what I'd suggest is get a massage therapist to, uh, to, to break the surface, so to speak, to get in there, give it a good couple of, couple of weeks of, um, of massage, and then uh, do some self-maintenance on it yourself so that you, you know, the worst of the pains out of the way, so to speak, and you can maintain it. So, those are a couple of things you can do to hopefully prevent cramp. What happens if you cramp up in race in, in a race? Well, when you cramp up in a race, it's pretty hard to do anything. You can't push through cramp. If you try and push through it, it's just going to get worse and worse and worse. What you need to do in a race is you need to manage cramp. You need to manage it. Um, and because you can imagine you've got these uh, overactive nerves or hyperactive nerves sending multiple impulses, the nerve pathways, the neuromuscular pathways are getting tired. They're not firing like they normally do. They need some more time to, to get their firing process sorted. So what you need to do is you need to downregulate the intensity. And what I'd say is if you're getting cramped during a race, I'd say good. You're pushing hard. You're pushing at your limit. But you need to back it off a little bit. And this is a signal from the body. You need to decrease your intensity a little bit. If you don't decrease your intensity, you're going to continue to cramp. Okay, so you need to slow down a little bit. So down-regulate your intensity. Get back into a comfortable intensity, whatever that might be. And this can be really hard because often it means letting that person in front of you or that is riding in the same bunch as you or paddling in the same group slowly slip away. You can let them slowly slip away, uh, but you know, get back into a steady rhythm and keep them within sight, or you can keep trying to push and have a massive cramp attack and just let them completely sail away on you because you have had to stop uh, completely to, to sort this cramp out. Now, stretching seems to work in the fact that you have to slow down to stretch, okay? It may not be the most uh, practical thing if you're on a surf ski, depending on where the cramp is. If it's in your calf or your leg, inner thigh, that sort of thing, you may be able to slow down enough to get some sort of drop that heel down and stretch it out through there. But if it's in your upper body, you might be in a little bit of trouble when it comes to stopping and cramping. Now, what about cramp stop? Now, you may have heard of cramp stop, and it's this little spray that you spray under your tongue, and it's herbal, it's a natural remedy, apparently, for cramp. Does it work? I don't know. I have tried it. I have drunken litres of that stuff and still got some of the worst cramp of my life. But in saying that, I think there is potentially something in it in that Trying to get your cramp stop out and spray it in your mouth, you're going to naturally slow down anyway. It's nice to be doing something proactive rather than nothing to stop that cramp. So I, I think it potentially may work. Why would it work? Well, I always thought this is a little bit of rubbish, uh, but I, I'm going to use it anyway. Recently, there's been found to have uh, transient receptor potential channels, TPR channels in your mouth that send signals to directly to your nerves, okay? 
And if you think it's a little far-fetched that there's sensors in your mouth that send things to your brain or to your, to your nerves, well, have a think of these two examples. In the mouth, there is a, a group of nerves at the top of your mouth. And when you drink a lot of cold anything, ice cream, slushy, uh, even cold water, what happens? What happens when you drink a lot of cold water or have a lot of ice cream or slushy in your mouth? You get a brain freeze. And the reason you get a brain freeze is that these nerves on the top of your mouth link in to your head. Okay? Which is really interesting and a little bit of a life hack for you. If you get a brain freeze, take, the, take your tongue and rub it on the top of your mouth as hard as you can and that's going to help um, decrease the firing rate of these nerves because your tongue is going to be warm and it's going to warm the back up and get rid of your brain freeze. You're welcome by the way in advance. So that's a little bit of an indicator I guess that there are these nerve signals from your mouth to somewhere. But also really interesting, your mouth can actually sense that there's carbohydrate in there. There's been studies done that have shown that if you take some carbohydrate into your mouth, rinse it around and spit it out, your body is actually able to increase increase its work capacity. Increase its work capacity. Even though you haven't taken that fuel on, you've just spat it out, your work capacity or your ability to work harder increases just by having carbohydrate in your mouth. So that means there's sensors in your mouth that sense carbohydrate. And what they think is that there are some sensors in your mouth, these transient receptor, receptor potential channels, that sense uh, bitterness or tartness uh, or spice. And what they've found is they've found that having something very tart or spicy in your mouth can decrease cramp. And there's a lot of research done around this uh, uh, what using pickle juice. So they found that if you are having a cramp, you're experiencing cramp, and you have pickle juice in your mouth, the intensity of the cramp decreases. All right, and you're thinking like, how's this actually possibly ha happening? To be honest, they don't actually know exactly the physiology why this happens, but they know that it does happen. So, with cramp stop, they're potentially trying to use the same sort of mechanism even though cramp stop was around a long time before this pickle juice came out the pickle juice idea but if you can get some pickle juice in your mouth and everyone's thinking well where do you get pickle juice from in america there is a lot of uh concepts well a lot of things supplements around um using pickle juice so they actually have drinks um, kind of like sports drinks where you can get Gatorade, Powerade, that sort of thing. There are drinks that you can get that are pickle juice, okay, which is kind of weird. I'd be interested to know if anyone out there uses pickle juice while they're racing. Seems like an awkward thing to carry. But I think with the cramp stop, if it can be developed further to contain something that is a little more potent, than what they currently have in, in their cramp stop. Because pickle juice contains uh, acetic acid, and it's believed that that is what triggers these receptors and helps relieve cramp. So, where are we at with all this cramping then? Because we've been talking for a good 20 minutes about this, and I don't really feel like we've made any headway. So, in summary, I guess, cramp, is a neuromuscular problem. It's not just the muscle, it's a neuro, it's a nervous system or the nerve and the muscle that's the issue. Training is really important to help prevent cramps. If there's a mismatch between your training intensity, duration, specificity or terrain, environment, um, this here seems to increase the, uh, the risk of, of cramping. So you need to make sure that you're matching each one of those to your planned race to minimize the chance. If you cramp in the same spot repeatedly, I would suggest getting some massage, mass, blah, 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 massage work on that area to help 
um, decrease the risk. Why that happens, I don't know, but it seems like it does. Um, nutrition interventions such as pickle juice seem to have some effect based on the research. Practicality of it for some people is a little harder. During a race, if you are having issues with cramping, decrease your intensity and manage that cramp. It seems to be the only way. If you can have a quick stretch of the area, it does seem to help. Now, what about nutrition in terms of sodium and magnesium supplementation? What I would suggest is make sure you tick those boxes. Make sure that you are consuming enough sodium while you're racing um, so that you know that that's not a problem. We know that fatigue is tightly coupled with cramping. So if you're in a fatigued state, state meaning that you haven't got enough nutrition on board in terms of carbohydrate, in terms of fluid, in terms of sodium, the body's not going to be able to function properly. Does it prevent cramp? It doesn't seem like that it does, but it can only help the situation as a whole. So don't think, oh, I've got cramp, there's nothing I can do apart from decrease my intensity. Make sure you keep on top of your fueling, make, on, make sure you keep on top of your hydration, and all of those things should have some sodium in them anyway, not specifically for cramp, but for uh, fluid absorption. And as long as you're taking those products at the recommended dosage, you're probably getting enough enough sodium to um, sort of tick the, the sodium box in terms of, of having enough sodium around to prevent cramping. If you just drink water um, and become hyper- hyponatremic, meaning that you don't have enough sodium in your bloodstream, then you're going to be in a really bad way anyway. It can result in death, uh, and cramps probably got to be the least of your problems there. But make sure you've got adequate sodium on board, not just for cramp, but for uh, fluid absorption as well. So Jonathan, I hope that helps, mate. If you've got any more questions around cramp or anybody out there has questions, follow-up questions about cramp, shoot over, leave me a voice message uh, at www.exponentialperformancecoaching.com slash ask, A-S-K. You'll see a little button there, record your voice question, and I'll do my best to answer it. All right, we're going to move on to our next question. Let's hear it. Hey, Matty, it's Colin here uh, again over in Ireland. Um, I have a question for you in relation to uh, weight training for the competitive season. Um, we're about three, four weeks away from the start of a new competitive season here in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, I'm a cyclist and uh, I've been doing your Ride Strong program with a couple of teammates for the uh, winter. Um, we're coming towards the end of that. We're in the max strength phase at the moment, uh, soon progressing through to the uh, power phase as we commence the new competitive season. I'm wondering what sort of gym work or strength work, if any, I should be doing during the competitive season uh, through from March right through to September uh, to the end of this, this season. Um, I'm 45 this year and I've heard it said that it's even more important for older guys to keep up uh, some sort of gym work during the competitive season but I'm just wondering what your thoughts on it are how often should I do it is it once a week once a fortnight um, will I see much benefit from it and what sort of program should I be doing if I should be doing something at all um, do I stick with your power phase uh, program um, or do we go back to something more basic and more simple what sort of weight should we be using is it heavy is it light so on so I'd just be interested to hear um, what you got to say on gym work for the competitive season thanks Matty cheers bye now so I'd just be interested to hear um what you got to say on gym work for the competitive season. Thanks, Matty. Cheers, Bainer. Hey, Cuzzle. Thanks a lot, mate, for your question. It is so good to see that you, or not see, but hear, 
that you're cracking into the Ride Strong program. Now, for those that don't know what the Ride Strong program is, it is a strength training plan specifically for cyclists that I have put together. Uh, you can go out and get an inside preview into that if you want to see a little bit more over at Exponential Performance Coaching slash Ride Strong. Now, Ride Strong is not just a, a strength plan. It's not just not a weights program. Uh, it has all the, the background detail about what we're working, why we're working it, and it goes through different training phases. And this is the most important thing for any strength training for endurance athletes is making sure that the training that you're doing in the gym is matching what you're doing outside or out on the bike in this case because that's really important you don't want to be trying to work on one thing or trying to develop the other thing out outside we we get this interference effect if we try and do that so in Ride Strong, what I do is I outline a bunch of different training plans for different training phases that match up with the different uh, things we're trying to achieve. Now, when we move into in-season, in-season when we're racing out on the bike, things change a little bit. We've gone through our introductory phase which looks at developing technique, movement patterns, and just general stabilization. Then we move through what's called an anatomical adaptation phase, which is the hypertrophy of a muscle. So making a muscle slightly bigger, because a bigger muscle is uh, a potentially a stronger muscle, and also strengthening of the tendons and the structures around um, our joints to help prepare us for the max strength phase. And this also helps decrease the risk of overuse injuries when we start to increase our training volume. So those two phases, the introductory phase and the anatomical adaptation phase, are all about indirect um, training adaptations or improvements in performance. They don't directly improve the muscle's ability to produce uh, force on the bike or improve on the bike performance, but they indirectly do it by one, setting you up for the max strength phase and the power phase, which will improve your muscle's ability to produce force on the bike. And they also do it by making you more resilient to injury so that you can train harder on the bike without getting overuse injuries. So moving on to the max strength phase and the power phase, this is all about increasing the muscle's ability to generate more force and therefore more power on the bike. And max strength training and power training or explosive power training has been shown in the research to increase cycling and running performance very, very effectively. And this is largely through increase of uh, neuromuscular recruitment. So you're able to recruit more fibers, which leads to more power output on the bike. So what should a cyclist be doing in the competitive season? Which one of those phases? Well, you've worked your way through those phases, hopefully, and you're in the power phase. Hopefully, this is getting to you in time so you can action this for your competitive season. The whole idea of the power phase is an improvement in explosive force generation, which allows our body to recruit more of those muscle fibers, as I was talking about, and this has been shown to maximize performance on the bike. So over the competitive season, you want to be working on both the max strength and the power phases of your training. So using those two training plans. And if you're looking at the Ride Strong uh, programs, that would be plan number five, maximal strength, and plan number six, the power plan. These two plans here are designed specifically to do that. Now, like you said, the older you are, the more important it becomes to maintain this strength training. We talked about this uh, in a number of podcasts previously. I can't exactly re remember which number they were. But as you age, there is a greater decline in muscle mass, which will affect your performance. So the older you are, you see you're 45, I'd say definitely want to be getting into the gym. How often over the season? Well, your aim over the season is obviously your on-the-bike training becomes most important. And, and I'm not, you know, I always say that. 
you're never going to be able to become a great cyclist by only training in the gym. You need to spend that time on the bike. There is no doubt about it, no doubt at all. And I'm not saying that you should replace your on-the-bike training with gym training. Gym training is a supplement to make you better on the bike. How often should you be doing it? Well, you want to put as much effort into the gym as you can without um, sacrificing your on-the-bike training. And so what that could look like for a lot of people is one session every 10 days. If you were doing one session every 10 days, that would be the minimum sort of requirement for maintenance. So you're not really going to gain anything, but you're not going to lose all of those um, gains that you've de- you've worked so hard for over the preseason. So the whole idea of in-season training in the gym is to maintain what you've already gained. And if you're doing one session, either a max strength session or a power session every 10 days, you should be able to maintain that quite effectively. Now, If you have a key race that you're building towards, so the early season races potentially aren't going to be as important as the later season races, if this is the case for you, then you could look at through the early season phases of your training when your performance is not going to be as important and you can afford to put a little bit more time and energy towards your strength training. You could spend a little bit more time in the gym let's say two sessions every 10 days or so. This way, you're still building those gains, you're still getting those gains in the gym that will transfer to the bike, but we're still building them so that they come into effect during those key races that we're targeting down the uh, the tail end of the season. So this might be you, it might not be you. If you want to maintain, you're going to have to look at a approximately one session every 10 days at a minimum to maintain those gains, not letting them slip away. What type of program should we be using? We should be using that max strength program or that power program. Which ones specifically? I would highly recommend alternating them. So if you do a max strength uh, one 10 day block, hit a power one the following 10 day block. That way we are covering both max strength and power those two areas that have been shown to maximize performance in the research, we're able to uh, apply both of those into our training. You may want to uh, decrease the amount of work that you're doing in those sessions, so scaling them down. Um, All of the programs in RideStrong are designed so that if you're short of time, you start removing the 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 exercises at the bottom of the program first so if you're short of time you know you might want to chop out the bottom half of the program and just get in that first those first four exercises if you're doing that you're going to go a long way to maintaining that strength um, even though you're not doing all of the program if you're doing that first top section say the front squats the glute activations the deadlifts and the banded side steps those are going to be your big hitter exercises up the top. Um, in the power exercises, again, the first exercise is a front squat. Uh, and then that is superseded with a kettlebell around the world as a filler or a maintenance exercise. Accessory exercise, depending on what you want to call it. Next exercise, a box jump. If you can incorporate those things into your training, um, incre- increasing keeping in those strength focused exercises and those power exercises even if you cut out a few of those accessory exercises around the fringes the bulk of the program you're still going to get the results that you're after so i hope that helps answer your question i hope the training is going well in the gym and more importantly on the bike if you've got any follow-up questions please feel free to send me through another voice message And likewise, if anybody out there has any other questions they would like me to answer on the podcast, feel free to send them through to me over at exponentialperformancecoaching.com slash ask, or just head over to the podcast tab and you'll find the ask question section under there. If you want to have a look at the Ride Strong program, you can do so over at exponentialperformancecoaching.com dot com slash ride strong there's a free download over there that you can download 
and have a read about it and a bit of an inside look at what it's all about. So I think that's all I have got for today. Until next time, get out there and train hard, but most importantly, train smart.